So here's how I've done some basic EMC testing. Uh, so in this case we have, I'm using a Rigel DSA815 spectrum analyzer and I'm looking at my Chip Whisper light board to figure out the source of um, some EMC problems and then how I can reduce it enough to pass testing. So as a base I'm using some readings I had already gotten from a test lab showing there were some emissions at about 288 megahertz which is a uh, harmonic from the clock frequency. And how can you sort of recreate those results and test it yourself? So you can buy probes and stuff like that and I'll show you some various solutions but the first thing I'm using is this really simple homemade uh, probe here and this is just a loop of wire, uh, coaxial wire and I've sort of soldered it into a loop with a break in the shield at the end. And if I plug this into my spectrum analyzer. What we'll see, so if you look at the screen here, um, as I probe different things you'll see the the spectrum, and I'm going from 9 kilohertz to 300 megahertz here, um, so you can see uh, the screen for example, laptop up here, and stuff like that. So not touching the board, you do see there's some something around here is generating some emissions. There's lots of equipment on um, around. So you could see for example as I scan the board, move them all in the same general area. Um, as I move around the Chip Whisper light board you can see the various emissions uh, spiking. So the thing is this is really sensitive to where we place it so I can put it right up to the board and you see all the uh, the various frequencies going up there and I have a marker right on 288 um, megahertz so if I zoom in uh, you can see as I'm moving around these various frequency responses so what we'll do is I'll take this probe and just try to put it uh, underneath the board and to stop it from possibly shorting out, I'll just put a piece of plastic over top of it. Um, and now, I can put my test board on top and have a fairly stable platform. So normally I'd tape this all down. Um, and in this case, I had some resistors in the uh, clock line that allowed me to limit the slew rate. So by adjusting the resistors or adding the capacitor, I could see what the effect was. Um, so you can see I now have a pretty reliable uh, signal and it doesn't bounce up and down too much as I sort of move around. Because, uh, you know, we want to see if we can reduce whatever the uh, magnitude of that one spur is. So if you want something a little more precise, I mean this you can see as I move around that spur drops off. So as I move off the um, the area with the microcontroller on it, that spur sort of drops off compared to when it's over it. Um, and actually if I connect, so if I connect to the FPGA you can see how that spur changes. So I'm just connecting on the computer here. Uh, and we can see the this change is more of the system has switched on. So you can see all of the uh, sort of new frequency bands that have come up. Uh, and this is because we now have a frequency being pushed into the X Mega microcontroller. So this guy's generating uh, a bunch of frequencies for that, for clocking it, as well as the ADC has now been turned on. We can move around and see how that varies. But What's sort of more interesting is using a actual probe set. Um, so this is one that Dave had shown, and it's this TechBox company that makes sort of some low-cost probes. Uh, I'm not using their amplifier here, um, so they just have a little probe set with a bunch of probes in it for 200 bucks. And what this lets us do is basically the same thing as with my crappy loop antenna but there's more rigidity to them uh, so you can mount them and have them actually 
possible to sort of keep constant without having to tape them down or something like that. So I can show you how you can see exactly where that one spur is coming from. And what we'll do is we can select uh, the various loop sizes. So this, for example, is a larger loop. Um, so it will collect, it, it basically it's less precise on where you collect it, but it has a different frequency response, so a lower frequency response than the smallest loop, for example, just a little hole you can see in the end there. Um, and you can see this looks very similar to our previous uh, setup with the coaxial wire. And as I move around the board, you can see the uh, spur is changing. So if I switch to a very small loop, uh, we can try to localize, you know, exactly which portion of the board that leakage is coming from. And you can, we can, if I move it right here, um, where that is, is right, this pin here is actually the, the output clock that's being sent to the FPGA. So it's sort of right where we were expecting uh, the issue to be. And we can do the same thing on the underside and figure out if there's, you know, so right here. And the, the trace itself is routed on this layer, I believe. Uh, so we can see that's sort of one of the problem areas. And we can move around to check if there's anything else. The final way I was looking at um, this is using another product from TechBox, which is a TEM cell. So let me just grab that. And the objective of this is to give you a reading over the entire board, a little more like what a, the, uh, the test house will be doing, uh, but right on your desktop. So that's what this guy looks like. Um, it's move this out of the way. So all it is is uh, effectively an open transmission line, and you're able to place your board inside it. So to use this, I'm going to terminate one end of the transmission cell, TEM cell. And then the other end, so there's just a, uh, you know, it has a huge termination resistor here because you can actually feed power into this and use this for electromagnetic immunity testing, not just the emissions testing. That's more, you know, people always seem to be concerned about, but the immunity is the other half of the entire um, standard stuff. And on the other side, I just have a DC block to protect the spectrum analyzer input um, in case basically if you accidentally shorted this to DC while you were you know putting your board in there um, you wouldn't want to risk damaging your spectrum analyzer input uh, it shouldn't be a serious issue for most of the stuff I've been doing here it's you know rated 50 volts DC max but eh, it's just in case it comes with it all right, so now we have we have nothing inside the cell right now, so you can see there's still some noise. Again, should be moving stuff further away. But what I can do is go ahead and take my uh, device and just insert it into the cell. And I'll put a piece of paper to insulate. Find some paper. Uh, so I just have a random piece of paper here that I'm going to use to insulate it. Uh, off the bottom. Uh, so what's happened is you can see my board in between uh, the bottom layer and this middle uh, conductor here uh, and while it's running we can observe the spectrum on the analyzer in the same manner. Um, so this is a little less uh, specific to how it's positioned within the cell so I can show you as I move around that paper, you don't see the uh, the absolute magnitude of the emissions changing too much. So I zoom back here. I'm sort of moving the board, the positioning of it, and you don't see as drastic changes 
in you know what that specific spur was. Um, so all of these measurements are just looking at some relative amount of change. You know, if I add a different value capacitor on that clock line, how many dBs did I lose on this the spur of interest? Let me just put the camera back. All right, so here is the system in the, the cell again. Um, and the TM cell is nice because the cables and whatnot can just go in the side. So it's, you know, the lazy way of doing this type of measurements. You can see again, if I unplug the, the chip whisper light, we still see a lot of this other crap because it's not a fully shielded a cell. So if I plug it back in, uh, we see our problematic emissions, you know, whatever it is, minus 60 dBm. Um, and again, we can do the modifications to the board and put it back to see the difference in harmonic. So uh, the TEM cell is just a little nicer in that we don't have to deal with uh, carefully positioning, you know, probes uh, on the board. The downside is that, let me just move the camera again. So the downside is it's not fully recreating the horizontal or vertical polarization test. So um, in this case in particular, this cell is very small as you can see, so it really can just fit a circuit board and I can't even move the, uh, the orientation of it. Um, so if I wanted to test horizontal, I really can't do that. You can see I can sort of angle this slightly um, and we can see the spectrum changing quite a bit. The distance uh, from the bottom conductor also will affect your spectrum, so if I grab, I'm trying to grab by the insulator here, and you can see as I move it around. So you do have to be, have it positioned somewhat carefully, um, but if I'm just moving it, you know, around slightly, it doesn't affect the, uh, the spectrum analyzer readings too much. So that's just a quick overview of some of the tools I was using to do some really basic measurements on emissions on this device.